It's five streams in six days, and this is your Monday Night Raw review for Monday, September 4th, 2023. It is Labor Day here in the U.S. Parts of this show felt like a labor to sit through, but tonight was all about the main event. And it was back on June 10th of last year that Gunther became Intercontinental Champion with a win over Ricochet. And ever since that day, he has held on. He has had an iron grip on the Intercontinental Championship. 452 days later, the Honky Tonk Man is in shambles. Because the one thing that he always held on to, the one thing that, you know, when he would go to the conventions and he would do all of these events and he would do these shoot interviews and everything, it was always about the Honky Tonk Man as the longest reigning, the greatest, and the longest reigning Intercontinental Champion of all time. And now, his greatest claim to fame, he cannot claim no more. After this week. At the end of this week, Gunther is going to become officially the longest reigning Intercontinental Champion in the 44-year history of that title in WWE. Ever since Pat Patterson went all the way to Rio de Janeiro, he had to wrestle polar bears, he had to wrestle alligators, and all sorts of demons and goblins and monsters to become champion. I, I Hopefully one of these days I get to see footage of this tournament. But from Pat Patterson to Gunther, nobody has held that title longer than this man right here. Now they did give him the main event spot. Unfortunately, they did not give him and Chad Gable tonight the 25 minutes I was hoping they would give them. But they did get the main event spot on this show. And these two men went out there. Despite the fact that we had two commercial breaks during this match, and probably, I would say, maybe six or seven minutes of a 15-minute match were actually viewable, uninterrupted on television, such as the nature of TV, unfortunately. But they went out there, and those last several minutes of that match were as good as any television match that you will find on this show. And they had the crowd hanging on to every near fall because they had the added drama of the record. And Chad Gable's family was in the front row. They really made you think that this guy had a chance, that he had a shot to cut this man off and prevent him from becoming the all-time record holder. But it was not to be. Chad Gable did go down to Gunther. And so again, by the end of this week, this man right here, will make the uh, the record books. He will officially be the longest reigning Intercontinental Champion of all time. All hail. There's the king right there. Tremendous main event. An excellent main event to a show that overall was a solid effort. Uh, there was some storyline advancement on the show involving the Judgment Day. Every, every episode of Raw revolves around the Judgment Day. After payback, they're draped in gold and silver. They have the undisputed tag team titles. Rhea Ripley is the women's world heavyweight champion. Dominic has the NXT North American title. Damian Priest, of course, has the uh, Money in the Bank briefcase, which got a bit of a makeover, which I will be uh, showing you a little bit later on. But J.D. McDonough, it appears, is now officially a member of the Judgment Day. It seemed like all of the members, by the time this show was over, were in agreement that he would be uh, welcomed into the group. That does not mean that the drama is over. Uh, but not only is J.D. McDonough now part of the Judgment Day, it looks like, Dominic Mysterio made the pitch to Jey Uso, who is now a member of the Monday Night Raw roster, that he too should join the Judgment Day. Which I, I, I am sure that he won't. But that was the pitch that Dominic made to him. We found out a little interesting tidbit as well in a backstage segment, you know, with uh, Jey Uso coming to Raw. The reason he came to Raw was because Cody Rhodes said on Saturday that he cashed in his political chips to bring Jey Uso to Raw, to right a wrong that was done on SmackDown. And so he helped bring Jey Uso to Raw. We found out tonight from Adam Pearce that there is going to be a trade. Because Jey Uso came to Raw, SmackDown's got to get something in return. Cody Rhodes was not on the show this week, by the way. He is going to be back on the show next week. Uh, but we just got a little window, I think, into how Cody Rhodes is going to end up on Friday Night SmackDown. The other thing we got tonight, we had The Miz giving the Invisible Man a skull-crushing finale. 
one of those segments on the show that just made me sit here and go, what am I watching? So let's get into it. Like and subscribe. We are nearing 75,000 subscribers, so uh, help me get there quicker by hitting that sub button. I sure would appreciate that. Super chats are open as well. If you get those messages on in, we'll hang out a little bit later on. I'll go through all of them. And 400 likes, a modest goal, I think, is the goal for Be The Booker. If we hit 400, we will do Be The Booker later on here tonight. So after some highlights from Payback on Saturday, Raw tonight opened with Main Event Jey Uso, the newest member of the Raw roster, coming through the crowd to the ring. And Jey Uso said, I always wanted to start the show like this, and he welcomed all of us to Monday Night Raw. Now, there was a comment that Michael Cole made on commentary. As Jay Uso was coming through the crowd on his way to the ring, and they mentioned the fact that Cody Rhodes had helped bring him over to the show, Michael Cole said that as a former EVP, I guess he can get things done. Oh, they're having fun with this. They're having fun. They are having fun with this, I am sure. I'm sure behind the scenes they're having fun with this, and maybe now they'll have a little fun with it on the air as well. So Jay said that he had only been gone for two or three weeks, but it felt like a lot longer. He said Cody called him unexpectedly. He said he did some things in the past and may have created some enemies backstage, but if so, they know where to find him. And that brought out not an enemy, it brought out a friend of his, an old friend, an old pal, Sami Zayn, came down to the room. And he said, look, there's going to be a lot of people in the locker room who are going to have a problem with you being here. You know, as he as he was saying this to Jay, you could have taken CM Punk's head and stuck it on Jay Uso's body, and the same message would apply. Because you got Sammy standing there going, look, you got a lot of people back there that don't like you very much. They don't like you being here. The same can be said for him as well. You could have stuck Punk's head right on top of his body, and it would have been the same promo. So Zayn said that he and Kevin Owens even, they don't really see eye to eye on the whole Jey Uso issue and he mentioned that Owens wasn't here tonight and and I said watching the street fight they had on the pay-per-view on Saturday and and the senton from the balcony and some of the other you know bumps that he took in the match I would be I would have been surprised if Kevin Owens was wrestling on the show tonight he wasn't on the show at all and I said you know now that they lost the tag team titles What's next for Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn? At least Kevin Owens. I said some much-deserved time off, I think. If he takes a few weeks off, I don't think anybody would fault him for it. So he said that he wanted to be the first person that Jay saw here on Raw so that he can tell him straight up, straight to his face, I'm happy that you're here. And Sammy praised Jay for breaking free of the bloodline. He said now he truly is main event Jay Uso. Zane said they have history together, and he didn't expect to be buddies overnight. He said he's proud of Jay. He offered him a handshake, and Jay did not accept. Sammy told him, look, I'll be here. When you're ready to talk, I'll be here. Then he went to go leave, and Jay stopped him, and he said, hey, Sammy, now that wasn't very oozy of me, was it? And He put his hand out for a handshake, and Sammy did not shake his hand. Instead, he came in and gave him a big old hug. Everybody popped for the hug. After all they've been through, for for all of the drama between the bloodline and Sami Zayn and Sami Zayn and Jey Uso going back to when he first joined the group uh, last year, this was kind of a a nice way for them to tie up that loose end between the two, put put, kind of put a bow on the whole thing. So I like that part. Sami left. Jey was celebrating a little bit, slapping hands with the fans on the way out as he was leaving. Drew McIntyre's music plays, and out comes McIntyre. And McIntyre does not look very happy at all to see Jey Uso. And they have a a tense stare down on stage. Michael Cole reminds us that it was the bloodline who cost Drew the undisputed championship that he tried to win from Roman Reigns at Clash at the Castle last year. So Sammy comes back out. He steps between the two of them. He's talking to Drew. He's saying, hey... Trying to calm him down. He's telling him, look, it's only his first night. McIntyre continued down to the ring. Matt Riddle was out next because he's tagging with Drew. He goes face-to-face 
with Jey Uso. And they have a little bit of a stare down. And same thing. Sammy is trying to talk to Riddle. Telling him to stand down. He walks past Jay. He makes his way down to the ring. And I like that. I like the fact. Because here, here's the thing with the bloodline. The bloodline up until recently. Was the top faction. The most dominant group in the entire company. Now it's the Judgment Day. But for years it was the bloodline. For three years. Think of all the people that the bloodline fucked over including Jey Uso. All the people that they screwed over, Drew McIntyre being one of them, Kevin Owens being another, Finn Balor, countless people that Roman Reigns and the Bloodline and the Usos have screwed over. So it's not a case where just because he's out of the Bloodline and everybody loves Jey Uso and he's moved from SmackDown to Raw that all of these people are supposed to welcome him with open arms, that wouldn't make any sense. These people hold a grudge. So, of course, it makes sense that they wouldn't be happy to see him on this show. They shouldn't be. Why trust this guy? Who's to say he's not in cahoots with the bloodline? So I like the fact that you got people giving him the side eye because, look, why do I want this guy on the show? I don't want him on this show after all that he's done. And, you know, as I, as I look at this, now that we have Jey Uso, and for how long, who knows? Probably at least a few months, right? Because they're going to probably do Jimmy and Jay at WrestleMania next year. So they have some time. But now that you got Jay Uso on the same show as Sami Zayn, and the two of them are friends, and they're, you know, they're hugging each other, and they're all buddy-buddy, Kevin Owens never approved of Sami Zayn being friends with Jay Uso. And so how will he react to all of this? How will he react to Sami being all friendly with Jey Uso because, you know, Kevin Owens has no love loss for the Usos. And I look ahead and I wonder if they, they can almost start a completely new story where over a period of time, as we get closer to WrestleMania, you know, Owens gets more and more frustrated. I don't want to say jealous, but just more and more frustrated of this friendship that these two men have. And it can start to create a rift between Sammy and KO because, look, this is a story as old as time, right? The story of Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. Best friends, better enemies. How many times has Kevin Owens turned on this guy? You know it's going to happen again. It's only—it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. As we get closer to WrestleMania, we know we're going to get Jimmy and Jay. We may end up with Kevin Owens against Sami Zayn. This year they were together winning the tag team titles. Come WrestleMania 40, we may very well get KO and Sami against each other in a singles match. And they can... They can start to plant seeds for that story, if that's what they want to do, uh, through this friendship that he has here with Jay. We see Kevin getting more and more uh, frustrated in the months ahead. So that, that's something that uh, they could pursue. That could be one uh, storyline for those two heading into WrestleMania next year. Because I don't believe, I'm, I'm trying to think, if they've never had a singles match or WrestleMania against each other. I think they were both part of the latter match in Dallas, or WrestleMania 32 for the IC title. Uh, but we've never gotten, I don't believe, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn at WrestleMania one-on-one. You know, Jimmy and Jay have said, they told Ariel Helwani a few, a few months ago, they really wanted one day to wrestle each other at WrestleMania. Uh, I, I could see KO and Sami having the same goal. They may, they may do both matches on the same WrestleMania next year. Now, Adam Pierce was backstage. He was talking in the hallway out in the open with Ricochet. He stopped when he spotted Seth Rollins. And he comes over and he asked him, what are you doing here? And Rollins said that he's the champion. and I'm where I'm supposed to be. Pierce said the medical team told Rollins that he shouldn't be here tonight. And Rollins said, no, no, I'm fine. Ricochet spoke up. He told Rollins, look, you don't have to carry the show by yourself. And Rollins again reiterated that he was fine, and he walked off. We had Drew McIntyre and Matt Riddle against the Viking Raiders in a Tornado Rules tag team match where anything, you know, basically anything and everything goes. These guys are just brawling all over the place. Riddle told McIntyre early on to get the tables. McIntyre shoved him back and said, you get the tables. So Riddle obliged. He went and pulled out a table. After a commercial break, Riddle is laid out on the table in the middle of the ring. Ivar is up on the top rope. He's looking to do a dive. Drew cuts him off. Riddle rolls off the table. He heads over to the corner to help Drew. 
and they're looking to give the big man a superplex. Eric, though, pulls the table out of the way. All three men come crashing down. Eric grabs the table, and he leans it up against the corner. Drew drops Ivar with a Death Valley driver, and he tries for the Claymore kick, but Eric pulls Ivar out to the floor. So Drew goes outside, and he tries to powerbomb Eric onto the announce desk, but Ivar is there to stop him. So he sends Ivar hurling over the announce desk and into the barricade on the other side. Drew goes after Eric. He ends up down on the floor. I think he may have given Eric a belly to belly. But now Drew is on the ground, and Ivar is on top of the announce desk, and he does a splash from the top of the desk onto Drew, who's laid out on the floor. So now we have both Raiders. They pick up Drew. They're trying for Ragnarok, which is their finish, on the announce desk. Riddle is here, though, with a knee strike. He sets the table up in the ring, right in the middle of the ring. Eric rolls inside. Riddle lays him across the table. He heads up top, but Valhalla is outside for the distraction. And here's Ivar with a kick. Eric and Ivar, they set up for Ragnarok. But now here comes Kofi Kingston. Now, there's no Xavier Woods. They're giving him some time off. They did a storyline injury angle with him. I guess it was last week. Uh, either last week or the week before. So here comes Kofi all by himself. And Kofi, he hits them a few times. He goes for trouble in paradise, but... He misses, and instead, he hits Riddle by accident. So the Raiders send Kofi into Drew. Then they hit Ragnarok to Matt Riddle through the table that Riddle himself set up, and they pin Matt Riddle to win the match. It was actually a pretty fun match. Uh, nothing terribly long, but it was all action. Uh, I thought that it was, it was fun. McIntyre was staring a hole in Kofi Kingston when the match was over after... And he was not happy about the loss. And with each passing week, it just feels like, you know, Mount Mc, Mount McIntyre is about to just blow. It's about to explode any week now. Uh, and so they're building slowly, but they're building to it. But there's also some real problems now between him and Riddle and the New Day that they're developing. Uh, so that's another match that we'll be getting soon, possibly at Fastlane next month. They aired a brief video, and this was a thing they did throughout the entire show. They had the, it's not even video, they had photos of many of the Intercontinental Champions from over the years, and they would flash a few of them at a time all throughout the night. Here this first time we had photos of former Intercontinental Champions, including the Honky Tonk Man, Shawn Michaels, Stone Cold Steve Austin, Booker T, and Roman Reigns head of tonight's uh, main event with Gunther and Chad Gable. One person that they did not show when they showed all of the people to hold the Intercontinental title, one person they did not show is this man right here. They did not show Hulk Hogan. Here's a photo I bet you've never seen before. Hogan never did win the Intercontinental title, but this photo here, is from a match that he had with the Honky Tonk Man at the Meadowlands. I, I had been to many shows at the Meadowlands over in New Jersey. Uh, this was back in February of 88. And Hogan beat him by disqualification. He posed with the title when the match was over, but he did not win. That is one championship that Hogan did not win. He won the WWF title six times. He won the tag team titles with Edge. But uh, Hulk Hogan was... He was never a, a Triple Crown winner or a Grand Slam winner in this company. But there it is. If you ever wanted to see Hulk Hogan holding up the Intercontinental Championship, there you go. Now, Seth Rollins was out to the ring next to address the crowd. Of course, uh, he beat Shinsuke Nakamura at Payback the other night. Nakamura did attack him when the match was over, but it was off the air. They put that footage up on YouTube. As Rollins was leaving, Nakamura attacked him from behind. So even on Saturday night, it was pretty clear that we were going to get at least one more match between these two. He said Nakamura did everything that he said he was going to do with Payback. But here he is, and, and they showed the World Heavyweight Championship around his waist. He said he's still the champion, and he said that he would give Nakamura what he wants, and he invited him to come on down to the ring. So Nakamura makes his entrance. He's already got a microphone in his hand. And he did not come down to the ring. He stayed over on the stage. 
Rollins urged him to come to the ring, and Nakamura said some stuff in Japanese. Rollins said that he wouldn't pretend to understand what he just said, but he assumed that Nakamura was accepting his challenge, and he called for him to come to the ring. And Nakamura responded by telling him no. Rollins said that he was confused. He asked if they were going to have a championship rematch or not, and Nakamura said no again. Who says no to a championship match against the man with a bad back? Why would Nakamura say no? What is the logic behind that? Rollins left the ring. He fought with Nakamura. Security came out to pull them apart. Shinsuke broke free. He delivered some kicks and knees to the back of Rollins. Ricochet ran out to go help Rollins out. So they are going to keep this going. Despite the fact that Rollins beat him clean in the middle of the ring on Saturday night, to win the match. Uh, they're going to squeeze one more championship match out of this at Fastlane next month. Had they taken more care, you know, as I think about the Raw roster as it is, there really aren't a ton of options, right? Gunther is someone that you save for a big show. You don't do Seth Rollins and Gunther right now. You just don't do it. And he's also still the Intercontinental Champion. I mean, you could still do it. But it doesn't seem like the timing is right because he's got that title and, and I mean, it's September. What are you, you going to put the title on him now for? So you got to hold off on that. What do you do in the meantime, though? They don't want to go with Seth and Cody. They've teased it, but they obviously they don't want to go with that match. So you look at the other heels on this show, and there aren't a lot of great options that have been built up for this spot. But you do have someone like a Bronson Reed. Had they taken more care with him over these last couple of months, they could have really built him up as a monster who is unstoppable and hasn't been beaten or hasn't been beaten in many months. We don't see him on television on most weeks, and he's taken some losses the last few times we've seen him. He could have been somebody, you could have gotten at least one match out of that. I'm not saying he would have won the title, but you could have built him up enough where, all right, you did the match with Nakamura, now that's over. Who do you move on to next? Can you get a pay-per-view match out of this? Right? Who do you put in the ring with Seth Rollins? He could have been a guy like that, but they just they haven't really uh taken great care with him booking wise in these last few months. So there just aren't a lot of great options right now on the raw side for Rollins. So I'm not surprised they're gonna go back to a second match with Nakamura. There's no need for it, but they don't have anybody primed. You go back to the judgment day. I mean, Damian Priest has the money in the bank. He can cash in at any time. You've already done Rollins and Balor. You've already done... I mean, we've seen Rollins against every member of the Judgment Day except Rhea Ripley. And, and honestly, I think that probably would be a good match, but WWE would never do it. Uh, so they just don't have a lot of good options right now. Backstage at Gorilla, Rollins, he was barking at Adam Pearce. And he told Rollins... They were yelling at each other. He told Rollins he was running at a pace that no one ever has run at before. I don't know. I mean, is he running at a pace that nobody has ever run at before? What are all these What are all these matches that uh, Adam Pierce is referring to here? I don't know. He's he seems to be running at a pace that's not all that different from the champions that came before him unless you're talking about Roman Reigns. At least Seth is on the show every week. I can't say the same for Roman Reigns. But he makes it sound like he's defending the title on TV every other week, which is not the case. So he said that uh, he was trying to save Rollins from himself. And Rollins said that uh, that doesn't work for him. That don't work for me, brother. And he stormed off. We had Ricochet against Nakamura. They wrestled for a few minutes. Nakamura ended up getting control. After a commercial, Ricochet hit a standing shooting star press. Went up top for a 450, but Nakamura dodged it. Ricochet hit the recoil for a near fall. And they fought over near the barricade outside by the timekeeper's area where Nakamura grabbed a chair. And he hit Ricochet with a steel chair for the DQ in a total dog shit finish. What a terrible fucking finish this was. After the match, Nakamura wrapped a steel chair. And here's one of the reasons why it was so terrible. Doing a cheap DQ finish like this, and again, he's a heel. Okay. It's still, it's a shit finish. It's a, it's a lame, lackluster finish. But it's very clear that they're doing another match between Rollins and Nakamura at the next pay-per-view. You could have given Nakamura the win here. 
He's coming off a loss on Saturday. He could beat Ricochet and do the exact same thing that he did to him here. Hit him with a chair when the match is over because he's an asshole and he just feels like doing it. Wrap the chair around his head. He was teasing a Kinshasa before Rollins ran out to make the save. You could have done the exact same thing, but they couldn't even give him the win. So he wraps the chair around Ricochet's neck. He's teasing the Kinshasa. Here comes Seth Rollins. Big brawl. Rollins flies out of the ring with a big tope, knocks down Nakamura. Nakamura, though, quickly recovers. He drives Rollins' uh, bad back into the ring steps, and Ricochet ended up using uh, probably the chair that was wrapped around his head to chase Nakamura away. And uh, that was the end of that. So we had footage of Zoe Stark and Trish Stratus at the end of the cage match from Payback on Saturday where Trish was berating her for not helping her win the match against Becky. Zoe laid her out with her Z360 pin. Back live, she's in the back talking about how she has a lot of respect for Trish Stratus, but nobody pushes her around. Shayna Baszler showed up to confront her, and the two of them agreed to have a match later on in the show. Then it was time for the Judgment Day. Came to the ring, Finn Balor, Damian Priest, Rhea Ripley, and Dominic Mysterio, all draped in gold and silver. Balor congratulated Dominic on one year since joining the Judgment Day. Can you believe it? It's been one year. What a difference a year makes. I mean, we were t we've been talking about CM Punk the last few days and what a difference a year makes. What a difference a year makes for Dominic Mysterio. Think about where he was as a character on the show, as a babyface. You know, Rey Mysterio's son, kind of the shy, timid babyface. And look at him now. This fucking hair, by the way, that he's got. This mullet is out of control. He's going to have fucking hair down to his, his fucking abs soon. Uh, but just... The, the character development, the stuff with him and Rhea, and some of the uh, the entertaining segments that they've done, usually around the holidays. Um, the match that he had at WrestleMania this year with Ray, which I, I thought was fantastic. I, I had a lot of fun watching that. Um, it's great. It's great. You see him progressing, right, each, each week a little bit more. The heat that he gets when he comes out. It is pretty incredible to think back to where he would have been a year ago and where he is today. It is pretty amazing. Balor thanked Rhea for being the voice of reason. He put over Priest for their win at Payback. And he also paid respect to J.D. McDonough, as well as himself, for becoming what he said was Grand Slam Finn. That's right, Finn Balor is now a Grand Slam champion here in WWE now that he won his uh, very first tag team title. So Rhea said Sunday proved that Finn and Priest really were brothers and they all together were a family. Ripley said that she was upset, however, that everyone is talking about Jey Uso jumping a Raw when they should be talking about the Judgment Day. And she looked into the camera and she said, as far as she's concerned, the bloodline has fallen and the Judgment Day is the most dominant faction in WWE. And... I would say those are fighting words, and we're going to get a, a big showdown between the Judgment Day and the Bloodline, but there really is no Bloodline left, so she's not wrong. The Bloodline has fallen. The Bloodline is Roman and Solo. That's pretty much it. Priest started to talk. He was immediately interrupted by J.D. McDonough's music. J.D. McDonough walks out, and he's got some sort of case that he's holding in his hand. We can't see what it is. It's covered in a, a black cloth. And Priest said, after uh, McDonough gets into the ring, Priest looks at him and just goes, you know, I was actually starting to like you a little bit. So, you know, you come out here to interrupt me. This better be good. Whatever it is that you have to say better be good. And McDonough said, you know, changes needed to be made to the Judgment Day. And he looked at Priest's Money in the Bank briefcase and he said that, that briefcase has to go. But what he meant was that the actual case has to go. And he pulled off the black covering on what he had with him, and he revealed a purple version of the Money in the Bank briefcase that has a piece of tape on it that says Senor. So it says Senor Money in the Bank. And there it is. That is the new Money in the Bank briefcase that you see there on your screen. 
Boy, they didn't waste any time getting those replicas up. This is up right now on WWEshop.com, and it can be yours if you've got 75 bucks to spare. You, too, can own the purple Damian Priest Senor Money in the Bank briefcase. There you go. Take that to work. Put your books in there. Take it to school. 75 bucks. it can be yours. So Priest loved it. And honestly, as I look at this, I mean, the purple does fit. <laughs> it does fit a lot better. I mean, that's the whole Judgment Day uh, color scheme. The only thing I would say is I hope they take the contract out of the other briefcase. I mean, isn't there supposed to be an actual contract inside? See, now watch him try to cash in on Seth Rollins only to find out there's no contract inside because he left it in the other one. So it doesn't count. See them doing some stupid angle like that? Sami Zayn came out. He said that he knows Kevin Owens isn't here, but did you actually think we were just going to let it slide that we lost the titles on Saturday? He said he doesn't see five champions in the ring. He sees five championship-stealing turds. And he called Dominic Mysterio the biggest turd of them all. And I think there was a pause here, and I think he was waiting for there to be a turd chant, and there really wasn't much of one, thankfully. Hopefully that doesn't catch on, because that's just fucking lame. So Zayn challenged Mysterio to a match tonight. J.D. McDonough spoke up. He said, look, you're not fighting him. If you're going to fight anybody, you're going to fight me. So that match became official for later in the show. They highlighted even more intercontinental champions in history. They showed photos of Pedro Morales, who I was happy to see that, because Pedro, for whatever reason, is somebody that they never really uh, focused on much. Never really talked about him, uh, which is kind of strange, honestly, that uh, especially when, you know, when he was still, I don't know. I mean, was he making appearances back then? I don't even know if he was really making many appearances at any kind of events, you know, years ago. But you don't really hear about him much in WWE. So that was the first image they showed was Pedro Morales, who was a pretty big name. I mean, again, Intercontinental Champion, Tag Team Champion, a World Champion, you know, pretty successful star for them. Ultimate Warrior, Razor Ramon, The Rock, Rey Mysterio, Wade Barrett, which, I mean, of course, right? They got Wade on commentary. And Seth Rollins. Yeah, here's the other thing I noticed as they showed these photos throughout the show of all the past Intercontinental Champions. Every version of that belt from the late 80s version that Savage and Steamboat held onward. Up to now, every version of that belt has looked better than the one that we have today. So the championship that we have now, that Gunther holds, can't hold a candle to any of those past iterations of the title. How, how, is, that, how is that so? How is it that it's actually gotten worse? I don't understand it. See, I think the problem with the existing belt is that it's too plain. I think it needs some color. Maybe a little bit of blue in there in the middle. I don't know. But I'm watching this. I'm going, man, these titles. How can we can't go back and have something like that? Let's let's go back to some variation of, of one of the older designs. Let's, let's, let's bring back the old one on the white strap even. I take that. Gunther cut a promo backstage. He said someone like Gable does not belong in the history books. He does. His legacy will be forever, and after the final bell rings tonight, he said that he will stand tall as the longest reigning intercontinental champion in history. Backstage, Raquel Rodriguez was talking to Adam Pierce, who said that uh, he would make whatever, whatever it was they were talking about, he said he'll make it official. I guess we came into the conversation late, so we weren't aware until later. We weren't aware of what they were talking about. So Chelsea Green showed up as Raquel made her exit, or so we thought. She said that she shouldn't have to wait in line behind Sasquatches like Raquel. And Pierce mentioned that Piper Niven, you're not going to believe this. And I don't mean to laugh, and I hope she's fine. I hope whatever it is, I hope it's nothing serious. But my fucking God. Adam Pierce tells Chelsea Green that her tag team championship partner, Piper Niven. I believe these two women have had 
one match together on television since becoming the women's tag team champions when Sonya Deville got hurt and went down with the ACL injury. He informs us that Piper Niven is not medically cleared. The curse continues. The curse claims another victim. How much more proof do you need? This woman literally shows up one day randomly in a backstage segment because Chelsea has no partner and says, I'm your partner now. They have one match together on TV, and now Piper Niven is on the injury list. I would love to know how this injury was sustained. I Again, when, when it comes to these women's tag team titles, I'm picturing this Final Destination type shit. Piper Niven's at home, you know, reaching up to try to get something off the shelf, and a fucking tape dispenser falls on her head or something, or falls on her foot and breaks her toe. Some, some nonsensical shit. Another victim. Chelsea says, uh, look, if you're talking about how people say the women's tag team titles are cursed, and uh, she's wondering if that's what he's referring to, and he wonders if it ever occurred to her that maybe it's not the titles that are cursed. And Green, she started going off about how Raquel, you know, she, she called Raquel a loser, and she didn't realize that Raquel was standing right behind her. And so, of course, when she turned around, she starts to babyface her and suck up to her. And Raquel looks over to Adam and says, you want to let you want to let her know? And Adam says, matter of fact, you two are going to have a match later on in the show. I told you, I told you people, I said this weeks ago, I said, burn them. End this madness and just burn them already. I don't know what they're waiting for. How many more people are going to have to succumb? This is like blood on their hands. This is on them. As long as they keep those titles around, more of this shit's going to continue to happen. Shayna Baszler against Zoe Stark. As I'm watching this match, I almost called the Charlotte PD to do a welfare check on this crowd because I thought they were dead. That's how silent they were for this match. These people didn't give a shit about this match. Which is too bad because I thought the work was, was pretty good. They weren't doing anything wrong. It was just a cold match because the fans just didn't care. They didn't care about Shayna Baszler. They didn't care about Zoe Stark. Now, Zoe has been a heel. And Zoe still is a heel. I mean, she just turned on Trish and broke away from Trish on Saturday, but she's basically a heel. Shayna Baszler is not exactly a babyface either. She was a babyface, as I said. She'll be a babyface as long as she's in there with Ronda Rousey, and it looks like people at the time, oh, maybe they care about Shayna. No, they don't care about they just wanted to see Ronda Rousey get her ass beat. And I said, as soon as Ronda is gone, as soon as that program is over, the people are going to go right back to not caring about Shayna Baszler. And that's exactly what's happening. So because you had two people who aren't really over at the moment, you ended up with a cold match. But the work was, was pretty good. Baszler caught her in the Kirifuda clutch. Zoe attempted to fight out of the hold. And a few times it looked like she might go out it looked like okay this the match is over but then she'd show signs of life and try to work her way out of the hold but in the end she went out and the referee called for the stoppage zoe pulled herself back up to her feet in the corner when the match was over and Shayna walked over to her and she was kind of begrudgingly showing her some respect like she was impressed by her and Shayna made a comment to her she said you put up more of a fight than ronda ever did and she put her fist out for a fist bump Zoe fist bumped her back. I hope that the idea here is not to make them a tag team. My God, please, for the love of God, keep them as far away from those titles as possible. <laughs> please don't do this. It will not end well. Keep them away from those wretched belts. Backstage, the Judgment Day were gathered together on the couch. Finn Balor said that... Uh, might be time for J.D. McDonough to join the Judgment Day. There it is. There it is. We are just talking about this on the review on Saturday night. Priest said that he needed to prove himself first. And Balor said, well, you know, if not for him, you and I might not be tag team champions right now. They asked Dominic, hey, Dom, what do you think? And he said, I'm fine with whatever you guys want to do. So then they looked over to Rhea, who is sort of the de facto leader of the group. I know they... 
they like to think of themselves, we're all equals, right? Even Dominic made that comment later in the show to Jey Uso. You know, there is no leader in the Judgment Day bullshit. Rhea Ripley is the leader of the Judgment Day. So they deferred to her. And Rhea suggested they wait. Let's see how JD does in his match later on tonight against Sami Zayn. So Priest and Balor, as they left and Dominic went to leave, Rhea stopped Dom. She pulled him back and told him to make sure that everything goes according to plan during JD's match. We had Raquel against Chelsea. Uh, this did not last long. Chelsea attempted to run away. Raquel ragdolled her. She connected with a boot and a fallaway slam, and then Chelsea slapped her. And Raquel smiled, and she responded by wrecking this woman with a clothesline. Michael Cole sounded like he had a, a, a coronary on commentary. He was like, oh my god! And they showed a replay. And then uh, she hit the Tejana bomb, and she pinned her. After the match, Raquel said that she talked to Adam Pierce. This is what they were talking about earlier. She says, not only is she getting her rematch with Rhea Ripley, but Dominic Mysterio will be barred from ringside. And she told Rhea that she would see her next week for the Women's World Championship. So we're not going to have to wait until Fastlane. They're going to do the match on television next week. Uh, this did not get much of a reaction because Raquel still is not over. It's a work in progress with her trying to get her to connect uh, with the audience, they, they, you know, like she made the announcement about Dominic is going to be banned and you would have expected a big pop and it was a very lukewarm reaction. Uh, and I also thought about this, what's stopping? Okay. So Dominic is banned. You do realize there's multiple members of the judgment day. She didn't say the judgment day is banned. I don't think, I think she was very specific and said, Dominic is banned. What's stopping Finn Balor or Damian Priest from getting involved <laughs> or McDonough? She should have covered all of her bases. Anyway, that's uh, going to be on the show next week. More Intercontinental Champions were shown. Don Morocco, another one, doesn't get enough credit. Don Morocco is fucking great. Go back and watch some Don Morocco promos. Talk about someone who's, I, th I think, underrated. I don't think Don Morocco is underrated by the people who grew up watching Don Morocco. I, I started watching at kind of the tail end of his run. But, you know, going back and watching when, when he was the Intercontinental Champion and uh, working matches with Hogan. And one of the earliest matches I can remember seeing was on a, uh, it was one of those Hulkamania or Best of Hogan Coliseum videos. And it was a cage match between Hogan and Don Morocco and Don, you know, he bled and you know, it was I think the old mesh cage that they use now. They used it back then, too. But Morocco was great. So Don Morocco, they showed Mr. Perfect, Bret Hart, Eddie Guerrero, Kofi Kingston, and Cody Rhodes. Chad Gable was backstage. He was with Otis and Maxine Dupree for a promo to address Gunther. Hey, Juan Ocampo. Thank you for the seven bucks. You are banned from collision. You just thought that was going to be over. Oh, no, 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 no. That's one of the provisions of CM Punk's agreement with AEW. Even though he's no longer employed by them, he still gets to ban people from collision. So uh, you are hereby banned. So Gable said that uh, he's already in the history books, being a former Olympian with a master's degree. Tonight, he'll prove to Gunther, his crew, he'll prove to his family in the front row that he is more than a tag team specialist. The world is going to see your desire to hang on to that championship is nothing compared to my desire to take it from you. Drew McIntyre was shown in the back looking for Kofi Kingston, and he ran into Matt Riddle. Riddle told McIntyre to calm down, and he vented about Jey Uso showing up now on Raw. He said he would give him a pass, but he would be watching, and if he screws up, he's going to take it up with Cody Rhodes because Cody is the one who brought him to Raw. So possibly some foreshadowing going on there. Kingston showed up and apologized for costing McIntyre and Riddle their match. And Drew didn't think it was a coincidence that Kingston took out Riddle a week after Drew accidentally took out Xavier Woods. McIntyre said that he would keep his eyes open just in case any more accidents happen. And he walked off and Kofi told Riddle, Talk to your boy. Then we got The Miz. 
for a bizarre segment here. The Miz came out for an installment of Miz TV. He said he didn't lose at payback. He exposed L.A. Knight for exactly who he is. And then he said, I'm going to introduce my special guest tonight. It was the man who officiated their match at payback. He introduced John Cena. And everybody in the crowd got all excited because he was not advertised for this show. All of the shows, for whatever reason, all the shows that John Cena is advertised for between now and the end of next month, uh, outside of the the, uh, superstar spectacle they're doing in India on Friday, it's all SmackDown shows. They're all episodes of SmackDown, and he may be a fast lane as well, although I don't think he's advertised yet. So everybody was all excited. Oh my God, John Cena is here, right? So they hit John Cena's music, and there's Stu, the cameraman. He's ready to film John come out from the back, and nobody comes out from the back. But he's filming as if Cena is there. So Cena sometimes will run to the side to look at the fans. Then he'll come back. He'll do his sprint down to the ring. And the cameraman followed all of his usual motions. As if he were actually there. It's almost like we couldn't see him. So John Cena the amazing comes Goonthar. down to the ring. Oh, look who it is. Jerry Lawler loves Goonthar, the magnificent. All, All hail, hail Goonthar. Goonthar. All hail the mighty Gunthar. $50 super chat here from Zachariah. Hey, Zachariah, who is going to Raw in October. Thank you very much, brother, for the bomb. I appreciate that. I'm going to get to your super chats a little bit later. So uh, hang tight. So the Miz acts like John Cena is in the ring now because he's got the chair set up in the ring and he's talking to an empty chair. And Miz said that Cena screwed him over on Saturday. He said it felt weird. He, he's asking the fans, can you see him? He's right there. He's sitting right there. Have you? Can you see John Cena? See, the loss on Saturday has driven him insane. Now he's seeing things that aren't there. Miz said that he's been able to see Cena and see right through him for the last 18 years. Miz said that Cena was sitting in the chair and he would translate for him. And he asked if L.A. Knight paid him off or offered him a job during these hard times. Miz then asked if Cena conspired with L.A. Knight. And the crowd did the yeah chants and Miz shut them down. He acted like Cena told him that he conspired with Knight. And he said that Knight's win should be thrown out. He acted like he was ordering John Cena to leave the ring. Then he acted like he slapped Cena across the face. Then he starts selling that Cena is fighting back. So he's selling for a Cena punch. We got some holy shit chants from the crowd. I will I will say that was amusing. That almost got a laugh out of me. The crowd chanting holy shit. That, that was kind of funny. Miz then hit the skull crushing finale on the Invisible Man. He said there was nothing invisible or imaginary about what happened to him at Payback, and he challenged L.A. Knight to a match. This time, no surprises, no special referees. And he said the yeah chance would end, and L.A. Knight would fade away. So, I don't know what I just watched here. I just watched The Miz give a skull-crushing finale to Air. What I get out of this is that we're getting another L.A. Knight Miz match, which we totally do not need to be getting. We got some really good promos back and forth between the two of them. We we saw the match. It was a long match. I thought it was longer than it needed to be. On Saturday, LA Knight picked up the win. He got the rub from John Cena. Do we really need to do this again? Apparently WWE thinks that we do. Jay Uso was walking backstage. He met Adam Pierce in the hallway. Pierce said that as a result of you being traded to Raw, SmackDown would be getting trade compensation with someone from the Raw roster going to SmackDown. And he warned him, he goes, some people on the roster here are not going to be very happy about this, that they could potentially be traded over to SmackDown because you came to Raw. So he gave him a heads up about that. Jay walked away. Tommaso Ciampa walked up to Adam Pierce and said, do you have time now to, to chat about what we were talking about? And he says, sure, come into my office. And Champa went off into... Now, I don't think that that meant that Champa is going to be the one who gets traded over to SmackDown. 
I think that would be stupid. That would be a huge mistake. First of all, here's the thing. Why would someone like Tommaso Ciampa be traded to SmackDown in exchange for Jey Uso? That doesn't make any sense. What sense does that make? They're not exactly on the same level. If you're going to trade somebody over to SmackDown, it has to be a star of equal value or greater. Jey Uso has become one of the top stars in the company. So, SmackDown should get somebody in exchange who is at that same level. Tommaso Ciampa ain't at that same level. And to put Tommaso Ciampa on a brand separate from Johnny Gargano whenever he's ready to come back would be incredibly stupid. Those two should be back together. So, the fact that he walked up to Pierce immediately after this means nothing. Whatever conversation they had was about something completely uh, different. Now, he said trade compensation. He did not say when this trade would be taking place. And that's the key here. Because I hear trade compensation. There you go. That's how Cody Rhodes makes his way over to SmackDown just in time for WrestleMania season. So he can challenge Roman Reigns and he can finish the story at WrestleMania next year. Just because Cody might be the one doesn't mean that Cody is not going to SmackDown this month or next month. It could be November, it could be December, it could be next year. There's no timetable on this as far as we know. But it's the easiest way now to get Cody on the other show without him having to win the Royal Rumble. Sami Zayn went one-on-one -on -one with J.D. McDonough. For the finish, Zayn gave McDonough an exploder. He went for the Haluva kick. Dominic Mysterio showed up. Boy, this fucker's been all over the place. He was responsible for the tag team titles changing hands on Saturday. Then later in the show, he came out to help Rhea Ripley win her match against Raquel. And now here he is again. This, kid, this kid's everywhere. He's on NXT defending the North American Championship. That's why I made the comment earlier. I said, what a difference a year makes. You know, now compared to where, where he was a year ago when he joined the group, He's on every show. I don't think there's anybody in this company who gets more face time on television at this point than fucking Dominic Mysterio. So he shows up. He drags JD out of the ring, saving him from the Haluva kick. Zayn beats up Dom, uh, but the numbers game ends up playing to his disadvantage. Dominic distracts him from the floor, and that distraction allows McDonough to roll up Sammy for the win. Somebody in the chat before made the comment. They said, Sami Zayn is the new eater of pins. And uh, I think you may be right. So Sami Zayn takes the loss. And when the match was over, he attacked Dominic. And J.D. McDonough now is in the aisleway. And he is in no great rush to come back and help Dominic. He's just standing there. He's watching. Sammy went for the Haluva kick, but McDonough finally dragged Zayn out of the ring, threw him into the ring post, he got back into the ring, he went over to Dominic in the corner, and he said, get out of here. He's telling him to flee. Dominic leaves the ring. McDonough goes back over to Sammy, who now is, is in the corner. He's back in the ring. Sammy ends up giving him the Haluva kick and dropping him. And so uh, we'll see if... if that comes back in some way, the fact that McDonough did not help Dominic immediately, and then Dominic at the very end kind of let him eat the kick instead. I don't think it's going to go anywhere because the very next segment was with the Judgment Day. They were in the back. We had Dominic. We had McDonough. They joined the rest of the group. Balor said that JD had a very impressive win, and he asked Damian Priest what he thought, and Priest said, you did all right. So Dominic left the group. He said, I'll be back. I'll see you guys in a little bit. I got to go take care of something. Because off to the side, Dominic noticed Jey Uso, who I guess just so happened to be standing there. It's like a cut scene out of one of these 2K games, right? People just standing around doing nothing. I always love the scenes where, you know, in, in 2K23, you're, you're in the locker room, <clears throat> and it's just this giant locker room, and there's just a guy standing there. There's a guy just standing there. And there's a guy standing there. Couldn't they be doing something? Like, if I'm going to walk up to Xavier Woods in the locker room, could you at least make it where he's, like, putting his boots on 
or if I'm going to walk up to Riddle to have a conversation, you know, he's fucking, you know, smoking something in the corner, or I'm going to go walk over and talk to this guy over here and he's having a conversation. Everyone's just standing there. Now I know why, because that's apparently what happens here in reality. So Dominic goes over to Jey Uso. And he says, you know, you and I both come from messed up families with Hall of Fame fathers. He said, I know what you're going through. He said, uh, you come from a broken family and now you have no family. Dominic said, no one likes you, just like no one likes me. He said, there are no leaders in Judgment Day and there would be open arms for Jey Uso in the group. Dominic told him to think about it and then he thanked him for his time. This is very awkward. Do Dominic was a little... Well, Dominic is always awkward. But during the segment, as Dominic was talking, Jay kept looking off camera at something. And I thought that this was going somewhere. I thought that, you know, even, even if it was at the very end, he was going to walk over and they were going to acknowledge it. And they never did. So I don't know what the hell he... Maybe he was legitimately distracted by something that was going on off camera that we couldn't see. Uh, this was just a very awkward segment the final batch of photos that they showed us of past intercontinental champions included randy savage tito santana triple h edge the miz and bobby lashley i can't wait for the chris jericho tweet talking about how petty wwe is for not showing him as one of the great intercontinental champions he wasn't wrong the other day. He, he did post something on Twitter about uh, WWE being petty. They left him out of, um, oh God, what did they, what, uh, they left him out of a, uh, a oh, it was the uh, Bob Barker tribute. That's what it was. Bob Barker passed away and when he hosted Raw, he had that great interaction with Chris Jericho and they took great pains to not show any of it. They completely cut him out. You would never even know that Jericho was involved in the segment with Bob Barker, and he said that was petty. I agree, actually. That was very fucking petty. But uh, wouldn't be surprised if he made a comment about this either. So the main event of the show was Gunther defending the Intercontinental Championship against Chad Gable. And Gable's family was in the front row for this. His kids were there. It was a whole family affair. Gable avoided a chop. He went to the uh, outside ring, outside on the floor. Gunther chased him. Gable got back into the ring, and then he drop-kicked Gunther off the apron twice, heading into the picture-in-picture -picture break. So Gable was dominant during the picture-in-picture, -picture, but uh, Gable caught him with a dragon screw. He applied a leg lock over the middle rope. Gunther put Gable down with a boot to the face that connected flush. They showed a replay of this. I mean, he booted this man right in the face. This wasn't like, you know, two inches away, a little off to the side. No, he booted him right in the fucking face. <laughs> he had a face full of foot is what he got. Short time later, though, Gable fires up, got that great baby face fire, and he lowered the straps on his singlet. Gunther dumps Gable to the floor, heading into yet another picture-in-picture -picture break. And this is this is the drawback. Uh, if you would have done this match at Payback on Saturday, they would have gotten even less time than they got here. So I understand why they saved it for TV. They had their lineup set. I would I would rather, even with the commercials, I still would have rather they do the match here if they were just going to put them on Payback and give them eight minutes. But the drawback of doing the match on TV is that you have these commercial breaks. And out of 15 minutes, this match went 15 minutes. We really only got to see uninterrupted about six minutes of it. So that sucks, but that's the nature of doing the match on TV. But the good news is that was the last of the commercial breaks. So they ended up on the outside and Gable got Gunther over for a German suplex on the floor right in front of the announcers. Gable, though, quickly realizes that if he wants to win the championship, he can't win by count out. This is not like that five minute challenge a few weeks ago or when they had their title match a few weeks ago and he won by count out. This time, he, know, he knows that if he wants the title, he's got to get this fucking guy back in the ring. So he brings Gunther back inside, and Gunther ends up catching him with a powerbomb, with a stack. 
Gable kicks out at two. And now the crowd is coming alive, right? Crowd was into this up until this point, but it was you know, kind of like a respectful reaction. But after that kick out by Gable, now they've got them. So they end up on the ropes, and Gunther chops him hard down to the mat. Gable comes right back, though. He hits a superplex. Back to the top rope, Gable with a flying headbutt only gets two. Gable quickly transitions, does not waste any time. He quickly transitions into an ankle lock. That doesn't last very long. He goes for the chaos theory. The chaos theory attempt is thwarted, but Gable gets a back suplex instead. So Gable hits the corner, and now he pulls the straps on his singlet back up. His target has been acquired. He sees Gunther in the opposite corner, and he goes for the chaos theory, and this time he gets the chaos theory. Rolls through, he does the slow takeover into a bridge, and Gunther kicks out at 2.9. And the place, I mean, these people were going crazy. Because now they have them, right? This is, this is what I was talking about last week. They play that record up, which they did a good job throughout the entire show, showing all the past Intercontinental Champions, talking about how tonight he's going to break the record. We got a pre-match promo from Gunther. We got a pre-match promo from Gable. So they did a very good job throughout the show of really building up this main event. I'm going to be very curious to see what kind of, of number they do. I don't know traditionally if the Labor Day shows are down by that much. Uh, obviously, there, there are shows that are down on Labor Day, but I'm very curious what the numbers are for this match. Uh, because their match a few weeks ago on TV did the highest quarter of the entire show. And even if you don't really give a shit about the, the ratings of the specific numbers, I do think that it is a decent indicator, though, of how much interest there is in a particular program or a match or a talent. And so when I heard that, that Gable and Gunther had the highest number on the show, I said, oh, okay, well, that's, that's pretty encouraging. And now here they are in the main event of the show. So I'm kind of hoping that they did uh, you know, a pretty decent number tonight. But Gunther kicks out at 2.9. People are losing their minds. Gable goes up for the moonsault. Again, not wasting any time. Right back up. He lands on his feet, though. Gunther had gotten his feet up into the air. So Chad lands on his feet, and he immediately puts him in an ankle lock. And Gunther is trying everything he can to get out of it. He's trying to roll out of it. Gable hangs on. Now he's trying to inch his way closer to that bottom rope. And people are, are getting louder and louder. He's trying to get to the ropes for the break. He manages to kick his way free. And he gets Gable down on the mat in a sleeper hold. Now we get loud chants of Gable, Gable, right? The people are behind him. He makes it back to his feet. He's vertical again. Gunther delivers a suplex, like an overhead suplex. He dropped Gable right on top of his fucking head. And then came the power bomb, And then came a wicked lariat. He wiped him out. Pins Chad Gable, he gets the one, two, three, and Gunther retains the Intercontinental Championship. And they cut to a shot of Chad Gable's family in the front row. They are absolutely heartbroken. And we got a shot of Chad Gable's daughter. And she, I mean, as soon as the bell rang to sign signal the end of the match, she burst into tears. And yeah, we, we've seen shots before of like fans, like little kids in the crowd crying or whatever. You know, people think of like Angry Miz Girl, which was a meme for so many years. This, I, I will say, I felt bad. I did feel bad watching this. She, I mean, it, literally, the match ended and this poor girl just immediately burst into tears at ringside. But she learned a very valuable lesson tonight that not every story has a happy ending. And so, with that win, come Friday, Gunther will officially surpass the Honky Tonk Man as the longest reigning intercontinental champion in WWE history. And as we look back upon this run that he has been on, he won the championship in June of last year from Ricochet. I think back to Clash at the Castle, which was one of my, I don't remember exactly if it was number one or two, might have been number two on my I know it was my WWE match of the year in 2022. I think on my overall list, it might have been number two or number three. 
But the match that he had with Sheamus at Clash at the Castle in Cardiff was just fantastic. I think back to that. I think back to the triple threat match at WrestleMania this year, where he defended the title against Sheamus and Drew McIntyre. And I actually think he should have lost it to Sheamus at WrestleMania. You know, I didn't really care about the record at that point. The record was still months and months away. Uh, it felt like the right time to put that title on Sheamus for the first time. They didn't do it. But they ended up having an excellent match. I think back to that. I think back to Night of Champions in Maine, Saudi Arabia, and the excellent match that he had with uh, Mustafa Ali. It has been an excellent run, and it's not over yet. It's going to continue now. And this run that he has been on, as well as he's been booked as the champion, it has restored a prestige to the Intercontinental title that this title has not had in many years. Uh, I know a lot of people were big fans of, of the Miz's run with it in 2016, 2017, around that time period. Uh, Miz, Miz at that point did as good of a job as anybody had in years of trying to make that title mean something. Before that, I couldn't even tell you the last time you'd have to go pretty fucking far back to find a, a period of time where that championship really felt prestigious in any way or, or was featured on pay-per-views and defended on pay-per-views. I mean, it's kind of sad to say, but just the fact that the title was even defended at WrestleMania this year. And it's a little bit easier now because you have two nights of WrestleMania, but I'll never forget, you know, like in, in the mid two thousands, we went through this period of seven years it's like seven straight WrestleManias with no intercontinental title defenses. It's it's just insane. And what he has been able to do in this run, the the work that he's putting in as far as his matches, and kudos to Triple H and, and Vince and whoever it is pulling the strings when it comes to Gunther, uh, because he won that title, Vince was still fully empowered. You know, Vin Vince didn't uh, go away, quote-unquote, until a few weeks after Gunther won the championship. If Vince never went away, would he have been on this long run? Maybe not. You know, we'll never know. But I think he's proven his value. He's proven his worth. He's proven that, honestly, at this point, he is beyond the Intercontinental title. Yeah, the Intercontinental title did a lot of good for a lot of people over the years. I think back to whether it's Randy Orton or other people that use that as a stepping stone to world championships and bigger and better things in their careers, his career path will follow along those same lines. So when I talk about Seth Rollins and the world heavyweight title, it's not a matter of if Gunther becomes world heavyweight champion. It's a matter of when is he going to become world heavyweight champion. Do they put it on him before WrestleMania and he goes in as the defending champion, or do they do it as as I've talked about, you save it for WrestleMania? And I would even have him honestly, if you ask me right now, gun to head, who's my pick to win the Royal Rumble in 2024? Who's someone who I would like to see win it or who I think has a real shot at winning it? He's my number one pick. He came very close this year. He went over 70 minutes. I think he set the all-time record this year for time in a Royal Rumble match. It was like 70 or 71 minutes or something like that. He's setting all kinds of records. Cody does not need to win the Royal Rumble for a second time. So he's on to bigger and better things. So when does he drop the title? Right? That's the question. Does he does he drop? Does he lose the title to anyone? Or do you just do a like an Asuka and NXT thing where he just kind of forfeits the championship and never loses it? Uh, I think he does lose it. I think he could still lose it to Chad Gable. I don't think we're done here yet. I mean, he beat Gable clean in the middle of the ring, so you can say, well, right, what did I say earlier about Shinsuke Nakamura, right? He lost to Seth on, on Saturday. Why run the match back again? You could apply the same logic here. Y you got me there. Selfishly, I just would love to see these two have another match on pay-per-view without any fucking commercials interrupting it. My idea was Fastlane, Gable, Gunther, 30-minute Iron Man match. No interruptions. Most number of falls in 30 minutes wins it. Imagine the drama down the stretch. Now, you don't have the drama of the record. The record will be broken at that point. But th there's no better big match performer in, in this company you look at his body of work going back to NXT UK, then Gunther, 
I mean, the guy is, is fantastic. The matches he's had in the last few years, whether it's Tyler Bate, Pete Dunne, Ilya Dragunov, Sheamus, Gable, the guy is fantastic. So that's what I'd like to see at Fastlane. 30-minute Iron Man match. Let's uh, run this back one more time. So that was really the story of the show. I mean, this show, to me anyway, this show is all about that main event. It was all about Gable and Gunther. I'm glad they gave them the main event spot. The Judgment Day stuff, you know, it was what it was. You know, they're, they're telling the story with J.D. McDonough. That's fine. Jay Uso now, he's a, a marked man on this show. We'll see uh, when the whole trade to SmackDown comes about, who it is. Again, Cody, Cody has to be the leading candidate, but you don't do it right now. I agree. I, I don't think the trade uh, should happen. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't think the trade should happen this soon. Uh, but we'll see if they start teasing other people uh, or, if, you know, do they just pick somebody or do they have a match to determine, you know, who gets drafted? I, I don't I don't know how they're going to work that. But the show outside of the main event, I thought was solid, but I didn't care for anything as much as I did this main event and it delivered. And uh, on Friday, history will be made. It's not it's not official yet. He still has to make it to the end of the week. But he will make it to the end of the week because there's no more shows. There's no more shows until Friday anyway. So congratulations to Gunther. He is the king. Poor Honky Tonk Man. Honky Tonk Man in shambles. I was going to say Honky Tonk Man's fans in shambles. But uh, are there Honky Tonk Man fans out there? I don't, I don't think so. I don't think there are very many of those. Uh, tonight, you guys gave this show a 79% thumbs up rating to 21% thumbs down, which is a, a very good score. I am going to imagine that that score is heavily weighted by the main event that we got. But uh, at Solid Monster is where you guys can go ahead and uh, cast your vote. What do you think of Raw tonight? The Labor Day episode of Monday Night Raw. What do you think of Gunther? Who do you think is going to be Gunther? Who will be the next Intercontinental Champion? I'll tell you something right now. Whoever that person is going to be, I don't think they're going to have the run that Gunther's had. So when he drops that championship, unfortunately, it might it might be back to the doldrums. I'm hoping not. I think I, I, I fear for the future of that title once he loses it. Uh, Naughty Delicious Chicken with Flavor. <clears throat> $5 Super Chat. After processing CM Punk's departure from AEW, I wish Punk the best of luck. I don't think he will retire just yet. I think he needs a year break. He already had a year break. He had nine months off. Gonna give him another year? He'll be a year older. He says, if I'm CM Punk, Take a yoga and Zen class. After that, I would take my talents to Mexico, UK, Japan, Australia, or any other wrestling promotion. Earlier today, he said, uh, I saw the HOG World Tag Team title belt and the design looks fire. He says, the House of Glory tag team titles are better than the WWE, AEW, Impact, and even IWGP tag team titles. I agree. The, uh, the new tag team belts are very nice, and they are currently held by main event. J-Line and Midas Black will be defending against the Vaude Villains. We're bringing the Vaude Villains back. First time in years, they're going to be tag team partners on September 15th at our next show. Uh, hey, Naughty Delicious, thank you for all the super chats. Give me back shot, Sala Monster, with a 499. Maybe not on the same level as LA Knight, but Trick Williams be extremely over on the main roster by 2025. What do you think? I agree. And I'll do you one better. I think it'll be sometime in 2024, not even 2025. I think it's going to be sooner than people expect. But he definitely needs to stay down there. He needs some more seasoning. He's not ready yet. But uh, he's got a ton of charisma. His work is improving. Go watch that match he had with Ilya Dragunov. Uh, it was a this uh, last week or two weeks ago, they had that match on the Heat Wave episode. The real CSO2 and still Intercontinental Champion Gunther. 
DEH Sires, Gunther Gable 3. 30 minute Iron Man match. Well, technically it would be four. But he says 30 minute Iron Man match where the final score is two to one and Gable's first fall is by count out. Second fall is pinball. Antonio Taylor, I think Cody's gonna be the one that gets traded to SmackDown. I do. I, I know it seems like the most obvious choice, but I think it, it makes sense for it to be him. DEH says, Honky Tonk Man, booking fees just went down. I mean, look, he can still call himself the greatest intercontinental champ. I mean, that was never true. He can call himself the greatest intercontinental champion. He just can't call himself the longest reigning. Rodimus Prime enjoyed the main event tonight. Congrats to Gunther on the win. All hail the ring general. Bucci, 973 Bucci with the 499 says, wanted to send you a little something for all the hard work you do. I have always loved wrestling over 20 years and your podcast makes me love it even more. Well, I like hearing that. I hope you don't listen to the podcast and just hate all wrestling. <laughs> There, there is stuff to hate, but yes, I, I like hearing that uh, people listen to the podcast and they love wrestling even more. For all, for all the drama and all the dysfunction. At the end of the day, we are all wrestling fans. Otherwise, what are we doing? Thunder Force put up the Gunthar meter. Uh, Chris Ludak with the $10 super chat says, will, will Jay and Sammy be WWE's answer to Cole and MJF? Where KO is the Roderick Strong playing a jilted friend. Is this what wrestling is reduced to now? Also, did not or didn't KO and Sammy face each other at WrestleMania 37? Oh, you know what? I think you're right. They did have a match at WrestleMania 37, didn't they? Man, have I really blocked out that whole fucking COVID period? <laughs> that was the first WrestleMania that had, I think they had 25,000 fans, right? In, um,. Raymond James Stadium for that show. I guess they did. Why did I think he had a different? Why did I think Sammy had a different opponent on that show? What's there's some sort of celebrity? I know he did Johnny Knoxville. That was 38. Oh, maybe it was Logan Paul. Wasn't Logan Paul involved in that in some way? Wow. Okay. Yeah, you're right. They did have a match at WrestleMania. Well, you know what though? This would be different. Because this time they could have a real WrestleMania in front of more than just 25,000. However many people they're going to have at Lincoln Financial Field next year. I'm sure it's going to be a lot more than 25,000. It was Logan Paul. See, at least I remembered that. I, I, I knew there was some celebrity involvement in some way in that match, like at the end or something. Wow. I, how about that? I completely erased the Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn WrestleMania match from my memory. Uh, Chris also says, um, first question, just to go back to your first question, they, I mean, they could do that. I don't think they're going to just, you know, copy that storyline. It's going to play out exactly the same way. But if anything, I just see it more as, you know, again, maybe a little bit of jealousy, but also I think just, he just gets to a point where. He, he's not getting the attention from Sammy maybe that uh, he, he's used to getting and he sees how close they've become and he almost feels uh, you know, kind of betrayed by that. You know, you, you, you're friends with him and what about me? I've known you for so long and how, however they want to put the story together. We all know how the story ends, which is Kevin Owens and Sammy Zayn on opposite sides. It's just a, It's just a matter of when do they do it? Does it come next year? Does it come the year after that? That's really the only question here. They're not going to be a permanent tag team. We know that. Uh, we got Super Pony, Kevin Owens against Gunther at Fastlane. I will be pushing this agenda until proven otherwise. Also, Sami Zayn is the new eater of pins. Wano Campo. Uh, as my favorite YouTuber, Darkside Phil, would say, ban, 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 gone forever. Uh, I don't know how you do it, but thanks for the content. Hammered from Wrigley. 
never been to Wrigley Field. I did see a Phillies game once from, from I guess, was it uh, Citizens Bank Park? And uh, I've never felt more in danger than I did going to a Phillies game. I was wearing a Mets shirt. And I was like Tony Khan. I, I, I've never felt like my life was in jeopardy as much as uh, when I was at that game wearing my Mets shirt. Slim Yoshi, congrats to Gunther, who will soon become the longest reigning champion. Now, how about a potential Royal Rumble win and a main event at WrestleMania against Seth Rollins for the world title? Book it. That's how it should go. I don't know if it'll be the main event, though. You know, if it were me, that would be your night one main event. But you know them. They're, they're always trying to bring somebody out of retirement or The Rock or Stone Cold or somebody. They get somebody like that on the show. And uh, Gunther and Seth Rollins are not headlining. But that would be my night one WrestleMania main event. We got Zachariah with that $49.99 $50 bomb. We'll just round it up to an even 50. How about that? I'm attending Raw in October, and I'm hoping they don't draft Cody to SmackDown so soon. I hope they somehow make it to Survivor Series since Roman's already been pinned. Uh, since Roman... Oh, Ro well, yeah, Roman was pinned by Jay in the tag match. Have Cody pin Roman in a Survivor Series match, and that way Cody doesn't need to win the Rumble. See, I, 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 I don't know that I like that idea. I, I think if if Cody is going to pin Roman, you save it for WrestleMania. I wouldn't be giving that away beforehand. That's my only issue with that. But I don't think you have to worry. I don't, it doesn't strike me that this trade is necessarily going to happen in, in the next few weeks. Base Beer is God of Seduction says, Geez, Gable's kids cry. Must be huge Honky Tonk Man fans. So they're the ones. Brandon Vasquez, thank you for the 10. I know this match has happened numerous times, but what do you think about a Cena versus Orton end of an era match at a future WrestleMania in the next couple of years? They never have faced off one-on-one -on -one at WrestleMania, and, and that is stunning to me, considering how many matches they've had. I pitched an idea on the podcast last year. I think it was last year. It was this whole scenario to... to, to get Cena, if Cena was going to win title number 17. Somebody asked me about does he win number 17? And I pitched this whole idea that would have had Cena and Orton at WrestleMania 40. With the idea that Orton by then would have gotten to 60 like Cena. And so it's kind of like the race to 17, who's going to get there first? It doesn't look like it's going to play out that way. Randy Orton, we, we haven't seen Randy Orton in over a year. Uh, we have no idea when he'll be back or what condition he'll he'll be in. Father of the year. There's one of our new super chats. Christian Cage, father of the year. Just signed a brand new contract with AEW. You know what Christian's favorite holiday is? Father's Day. And uh, he'll have many more Father's Days to celebrate under contract to Tony Khan. Would I mind Cena Orton at WrestleMania as as almost like it would be kind of a legends match at this point? No, I wouldn't mind it. It's been long enough if they want to have one last match together. They never had a singles match in Mania. I wouldn't mind it. Uh Booba says I love the Cody. Used to be an EVP comment by Michael Paul. Devin from NJ2000, would Solomonster bring Punk to Hog? No comment. Uh, Zizu. Is CM Punk a bigger draw than MJF or John Moxley? I've gotten an argument on Twitter and wanted to know your thoughts. Is he a bigger draw? Yes. Yes, I believe he is. And again, it's not as if Collision was pulling in 800,000 every single week like Dynamite does. Uh, but if you look at other business metrics, if you look at uh, pay-per-view buy rates that, you know, shifted when Punk 
came into the company and when Punk was featured in main event matches and merch, you know, certainly on the merchandise side, there's no comparison. Even the week that he got fired, he was the number one merch seller in the company. So was Punk a draw? I don't think anybody can deny the fact that Punk was a draw for them. Absolutely. Was he a bigger draw than, than Moxley and MJF? Yes, I believe he was. Antonio Taylor, Chad's little girl got me a little also. Yeah, that it, again, it was it was it was tough. It was tough to see that because she nobody smartened her up. She's not old enough yet, I guess, to be smartened up. Base beer says buy or sell 24/7 or a women's tag team title. Oh boy, that's like asking me, what do you want to do? You want to get stabbed or shot? Or burned alive. Ah, man. Jeez. You know what? 24-7 title. At least, at least the thing wasn't cursed. So I would go with the 24-7 title. And then I would give it a burial at sea. We would never see it again. Uh, Mr. Sires says, What's great is Gunther has won his matches clean. That is a very good point. And I, I talked about how the mat is sacred to him. And he wins, you know, in an honorable fashion. We don't see him uh, cheating. We don't see him hooking the tights. We don't constantly see Imperium getting involved in his matches. Maybe sometimes, but like not, not the way that we do with the Judgment Day or, you know, with the outcasts in AEW. He goes in there. He's a heel, but he goes in there and he wins decisively like a boss. He's not your typical, like, chicken shit WWE heel. And I like that. You don't always see that. Uh, the Mount Vernon kid, Christopher Bennett. Gable said Gunther trash talking in front of his kids. Personal. He will be taking the IC championship. It's not over. Oh, just post it on the WWE channel. So I guess what he's saying is that Gunther talked trash in front of his kids. Maybe that was after they went off the air. All right, good. So, yeah, this this pretty good chance we're going to get a rematch at Fastlane. Uh, I, I like the 30-minute Iron Man stipulation. They could do that. They could do two out of three falls. See, two out of three falls, though. That See, that, that, I wouldn't do that, actually, now that I think about that. I, I like the drama that 30-minute Iron Man. Down the stretch. That that's what I think they should. Do. Uh, we've got uh, Mr. Choi. Is that Choi or no? That's an L. I thought that was an I. Mr. Chol, chiming in with a ten dollars super chat. Duat, thank you very much. He says, "Long time listener, first time chatter. Been listening to you since I was about twelve, and I am twenty-four soon. Holy shit." Uh, you are just as big a voice to my wrestling experience as Jim Ross is to old fans. Well, that is probably the greatest compliment that's been paid to me in quite some time. Wow. So, uh, Duat, thank you. Thank you for the kind words. I don't know if I deserve that, but that means a lot. Athletic Geek, 89. After going to Honky Tonk Man's Twitter, it doesn't seem like he's taking losing his record with humility and grace. He is retweet the hell you say. He is retweeting folks talking about how more people paid to see him and have not paid for Gunther. Hey, look, he got a lot of heat when he was the champion. And I, I don't know offhand the all the Honky Tonk Man house show numbers, how they did. He he did business. You know, he was he was a hated heel back then. Nobody can take that away from him. But you saying that it doesn't look like he's taking the the loss of his record with humility and grace. I mean, I'm not exactly gonna sit here and be shocked about that. Humility and grace are also not words that I usually associate with the honky tonk. Athletic Geek, thank you very much. Uh, Duat, 
with another $10 super chat. Potentially hot take. Most of wrestling discourse surrounding the business side is just astrology for wrestling fans. Can anybody in the wrestling community source numbers for merch sales? Yes. Uh, I would suggest uh, if, if that's the sort of thing that you're interested in tracking. I know Brandon Thurston does a very good job of tracking a lot of these metrics uh, for WrestleNomics. If you go to WrestleNomics.com, I would... Um, I think it might be a Patreon thing. You might have to subscribe, but as far as the business side of wrestling, I know he does. He's like he's like doing God's work as far as that goes. He does a very good job. And he, even Meltzer and the Observer has merch numbers in there. I don't know if they're sourced, if he specifically cites the source that he gets the information from. I know he has his sources for that thing. He, I mean, he's had merch numbers in the Observer for years and years. Uh, but Brandon Thurston is somebody who reports on a lot of that stuff and that his inf his information usually makes it out you know to some of the wrestling sites <clears throat> uh deh sires and also just to go back to that point if um you're wondering as far as top merch sellers by company i think there's a section on wweshop.com that has best sellers and so you can probably track some of that information there as well i mean again if you're assuming the information is on the up and up they do have a section, or they did, on the website where it will show you what, like, the top-selling current items are. And, uh, I know LA Knight is pretty high. I think he's at the top of the list right now. Uh, DEH says, we getting a fourth Gable Gunther in an exclusive. He said, I swear to everybody, on myself, on my career, that is not the end. I am taking the championship. Hell yeah, man. Let's do it. Let's run it back. Can't wait. I don't see how you can watch that match tonight and not want to see that again. I'm here for that. Boney. Personally, I think Gunther should go to WrestleMania as the champion, and it should be champion against champion against Rollins, where Gunther ascends to the top. Well, and then you would have to have the title vacated. Kind of like what happened with the Ultimate Warrior of WrestleMania 6, because you need to have a secondary champion. Otherwise, you just end up with another Roman Reigns, and we don't need another Roman Reigns. So you could do that. If you don't want to beat him at all, then I understand the logic. If you want him to go into WrestleMania undefeated, then you would have to keep the title on him. I don't think that's necessary. I think Chad Gable winning the title would be a great payoff and I think it would be a fantastic story and it would give Gable a chance to you know get a, a good singles run you know as the second biggest champion on the brand uh, and give him a serious singles run instead of just continuing to do the Alpha Academy stuff I think the story ends with Gable winning the belt can't keep making these promises over and over again and not eventually come through. Uh, God of Seduction says, Backshot Lariat. I'll let you take that move. You can take that move. How about that? Boney. Has Tony Khan surpassed Eric Bischoff as a promoter and booker? As a promoter and booker. Eric Bischoff. I don't know that Eric Bischoff was a great booker. Um, he had a lot of business ideas. Uh, the way he formatted Nitro was a great formula. You know, the NWO idea, wherever he, he got the inspiration from it from. I, I believe it was Japan. You know, he had the foresight to go with that idea and it took off. Brought him great success, and for the first time, Vince McMahon had his back up against the wall. Vince McMahon will never have his back up against the wall from Tony Khan. Competition is great. AW is doing great for a company that's not even five years old. Um, they just put 81,000 people in Wembley Stadium, you know, four and a half years into the company's existence. You can't minimize and downplay those accomplishments. You know, it, it's it's hard. It's hard to say 
just because we're talking about two different eras. I I'm thinking back to the Monday Night War period, and, you know, I mean, that was the most competitive, fun period in the history of the business. And both companies, you know, ended up doing booming business, television ratings, and now it's just kind of a completely different world. Eric Bischoff had television on TNT and TBS. Tony Khan has television on TNT and TBS. Were WCW pay-per-views doing million-dollar buy rates on a regular basis? No. And AEW now has had a few of them. They've had a few million-dollar buy rates. They just did a $10 million gate at Wembley. Uh, I'm pretty sure that WCW never did a $10 million gate, but yeah, you factor inflation into that. There's a lot of factors at play here. I, I don't think Eric Bischoff was a better booker than Tony Khan. As a promoter, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think part of it with Bischoff, frankly, also was luck. You know, part of it was he made some smart business decisions, but part of it also, I think, was just luck and, and just the nature of the big names that he had, the Hogans and the Savages. And he wasn't able to replicate that success anywhere else. It's kind of like a Vince Russo situation. You know, Russo and WWE, the formula worked. When he left, it didn't work. It didn't work anywhere else. He never attained that same level of success. Bischoff's the same thing. You know, Bischoff got hot there in the 90s. He got fired a couple of different times, or at least once. Um, and then he, you know, he was a great general manager character in WWE, but that's it. That's all it was, was character. In TNA, he and Hogan went in there and they fucking helped destroy the company. So, I mean, does that make him a great booker? I don't think so. But he wasn't really... Again, you use that word booker and it's like, I don't look at Bischoff as a booker. There were other people in the company working for Bischoff who were helping in doing the booking at, at different times, whether it was uh, Kevin Sullivan or... Yeah, whoever it matters. Kevin Nash had the book at one point. I feel like almost everybody had the book at one point in WCW. Oh, uh, we got Juan says better theme. Rated RKO or Charles Mason from House of War. I don't like Charles Mason. I, I I think he's a dick, but I will say his theme music is 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 a banger. I like his theme music. It's too bad it's attached to him. Juan says he's the honky tonk man. He's cool. No, no, you, you got it wrong. You got it wrong. He goes, um, he's got Peggy Sue beside him, with the colonel's in the back. He's coming to your town in a pink Cadillac. He's the honky tonk. He's cool. He's cocky. He's bad. There was another song. What was the other song? That, um, honky had two songs. He had his theme song, but there was another song, and I forgot what that other song was. Just popped out of my head. Justin says, give Honky Tonk Men some honka burning love. Oh, there it is. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Thank you. I was wondering. Honka, honka, honky, honky love. Right? That's who it was. We need a honky, honky, honky love. We need a honka, honka, honky love. I'm the one you've been dreaming of. You know you've got to, got to, got to have some honky love. That's what it is. Thank you. See, you guys always come through for me. When, I, when I'm looking for the name of something, forget something, right there to back me up. Keyshawn Johnson, are you going to do a watch along of the 15th anniversary of the greatest WrestleMania match next year and has a match surpassed it? being uh, Sean and Undertaker, WrestleMania 25. I think that will probably be one that we have to do next year. I didn't even, I didn't even realize we're coming up on 15 years. That's crazy. That's pretty nuts. I don't think anything's, I don't think anything has uh, surpassed it for me. I think I'm actually overdue to go back and watch it and see if, see if it still holds up. But that would still be at the top of my list. Sonic Youth, you're the man, Solid Monster. You're the man. JR is better, but you're the man. Here's five bucks. Well, I appreciate the honesty. 
Uh, Mark Peter, I think they should wait on the Gable Gunther rematch for Survivor Series. Take the next few weeks to build and make Gable's character more serious. I don't think they need to wait that long. I think Fast Lane is the time. To Gable's already showing some some more, yeah, you know, more of a serious side. He's never going to be 100% Lance Storm serious, you know. He's friends with Otis. Uh, they they like having that levity on the show. I think that, that yeah, that's fine. You can have some of the the humor there, but you look at that promo he cut early. You know, I mean, it was there was still some some humor, I guess, involved there, but you don't need two months to get him more serious. All you need is a few weeks. Put together some great video packages. Show some highlights of Gable from his, his Olympic days. Show him training. Let's get some of those videos to really promote the, the pay-per-view. You can do similar videos for Gunther as well. I mean, training videos. You know, Gunther goes back home to train. It's like Brett going back to Canada to train for the Iron Man match before WrestleMania 12. They did those same videos with, with Brett and Sean. Sean training with Jose Lothario, going back to his roots. Do a similar build-up for Gable and Gunther. Fast lane's not for another four weeks. You got plenty of time. Athletic Geek 89, if uh, it was brought up earlier about title for title at WrestleMania, would you have to vacate the IC title if they do Rollins and Gunther. Uh, Rollins won the US title while he was the world champion and defended both of them. I, I do remember that. That's uh, what led to the Sting match and Sting getting hurt. Um, again, I, I really prefer the idea of Gable getting that win. I don't think it's required. I don't think it's necessary that Gunther stay undefeated between now and WrestleMania, that he goes in as the Intercontinental Champion. You know, would it would it help elevate the IC title by having it featured in, in possibly the main event of night one of WrestleMania? Sure. Yeah, it would. It would be a great spot for that title to be in. I don't think it's necessary, though. I think, you know, the title is, for a lot of people, it has traditionally been a stepping stone to bigger things. He does not need to be the Intercontinental Champion going into WrestleMania next year. I could see the marquee value in doing champion against champion, title for title. Um, I don't hate the idea. I just really would love to see Chad Gable get that big payoff. I really think it would be a shame for him. If he's going to get a fourth match, I mean, how many matches is he going to lose? If he's going to continue to be fed matches, he has to win at some point. It reminds me of Batista. There's a period during SmackDown in the mid-2000s where Batista was being gifted World Heavyweight title matches all the time. Eventually, he won. It's like, yeah, no shit. Eventually, you're going to win if you keep being fed title matches. I, I think if they're doing it again, Gable has to win. He should win. Uh, Sonic Youth, as someone who started watching in 08, could never fathom in the Attitude Era watching guys like Rock and Stone Cold who are so clearly special yet never been champion. Gunther and LA Knight are the closest that I have felt to them. And Juan Ocampo says everyone in the chat loves Deuce and Domino's theme. I don't even remember Deuce and Domino's theme. I remember Deuce and Domino and Cherry. I don't remember their theme song. So obviously, it didn't leave a very great impression on me. Some good questions in there. Thank you, guys. Very, uh, very kind of you. We also beat the goal for Be the Booker tonight. So let's go ahead and do it. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to Be the Booker. We had a pretty good night doing Be the Booker last night. Let's hope that we can replicate that here. Here we go. Let's kick things. You know what? Let's let, tell you what. Let's do something a little bit differently here. Why don't we switch it up? We'll do the women first. We'll do women's be the booker first. We usually do men, then women, then tag teams. We'll do it a little bit differently. On the women's side, we have one half of the women's tag team champions, Chelsea Green. Chelsea Green. In a 
singles match, not a tag team match. Going to be taking on May Young. <laughs> Chelsea Green and May Young. Rest in peace, May Young. Tough old broad. Tough old broad was May Young, as they used to say. She'd probably call herself a tough old broad. All right, we got Dude Love. I'm almost positive the, the woman on the left in this photo is his wife. Dude Love, one on one with Hulk. Hogan. Hogan and Foley. Hulk Hogan and Dude Love. That actually kind of sounds like it would have been a match in the 80s, and Dude Love would have been a one-off opponent that was quick, quickly dispatched. I think we all know who would have come out on the winning end of that one. As he should have. I mean, let's be honest. Hulk Hogan and Dude Love, there's only one winner for that match. And on the tag team side, AOP, Akam and Razar. How funny is that, that we land on Akam and Razar? I just talked about them on the podcast yesterday. They're coming back. Not only are they coming back, you might, uh, you might see them tomorrow night. You might actually see them on NXT tomorrow night. But we got them first here in Be The Booker. Akam and Razar taking on... Matt Riddle, what the fuck is he wearing? Matt Riddle and, oh, he's dressed like Randy, I think. <laughs> that's what it is. That's right, He. that's right, I forgot. On this episode of Raw, he was trying to dress up like Randy Orton, so he has some facial hair on him. I didn't recognize him at first, he looked like a Frenchman. RK Bro, Randy Orton and Matt Riddle taking on AOP. I'm going to give it the bell because I actually I actually miss Randy Orton. I want to get Randy Orton back in the ring, so I'll give that the bell. RK Bro. I'm just I'm just amused by this this look for Riddle here with the I mean, what would, it's not really a soul patch. I guess, is it a soul patch? But a soul patch would be smaller. Anyway, maybe we'll get to see RK Bro one day. Maybe one day we'll get to see them again. There was still some gas left in the tank, right? They were still a hot act on TV, selling merch and everything before they unfortunately got uh, cut short there. Hopefully we'll see Randy Orton back soon. Riddle looking like Her Hercule Perot. I don't know who that is. And I probably just botched their name, too. Is it Herc? Is it Hercule or Hercule Perot? Who is that? That's a bro T, <laughs> says Steve. <laughs> a bro T? Okay, we'll call it a bro T. Uh, that's a dead rabbit's foot on Riddle's chin. It does kind of look like a dead rabbit's foot. Wednesday night, I will be live with you after Dynamite, and uh, so ends the streak. Tonight is the end of the streak, streaming for is it five, uh, I said five times in six days this week. It's been a very busy weekend. We had back-to-back pay-per-views and a podcast. I hate when it works out that way. I guess it'll be that way probably every Labor Day going forward. But uh, I definitely have, uh, unfortunately, I'm very sleep deprived. So it'll be nice to not have to go live tomorrow night. But I hope you will join me on Wednesday. Uh, should be an interesting episode of Dynamite now in light of uh, them kind of moving on from the uh, CM Punk era. And we'll see uh, what direction they go in now that All Out is in the books. They have Wrestle Dream coming up at the beginning of October. John Moxley is the new international champion. Brian Danielson is back. Uh, he was pretty optimistic about the idea of maybe working collision more often now that there's a void to be filled on that show. 
So uh, I don't know if that means we won't see him much on Dynamite anymore. I hope that's not the case. But it has been announced that MJF is going to address Samoa Joe after uh, what happened on the pay-per-view last night. That is a match that uh, I am very much looking forward to. So we will have the uh, MJF Samoa Joe War of Words coming up soon. Devin from NJ, buy or sell, Wonder Years, or Boy Meets World? Boy Meets World, all the way. I watched the, the, the Wonder Years when I was younger, and it has no replay value for me. With the narrator and everything, eh. Not a, not, not a fan, not really much of a fan anymore of the Wonder Years. I'm a Boy Meets World guy. Mr. Feeney, who's still alive, by the way. Mr. Feeney all the way. We have to protect Mr. Feeney at all costs. All right, I'll see you guys Wednesday night. Be well, stay safe. Didn't Joe break Roddy's neck too? Yeah, that's right. Samoa Joe did. That's right in the story. He was the one who gave Roderick Strong the neck injury. That's a very good, very good point. Uh, Bliss fan at some point, yes. Yeah, Sound of Gamer will return. Again, it's been very busy these last several weeks. Uh, but it will, it will return at some point. When am I doing a 24-hour stream? Why don't you just bury me now? I'll, I'll dig the grave. You can start shoveling dirt on top of me. Yeah, I think he... Mr. Feeney, my God, how old would he be? How old would he be? Probably gotta be in his 90s, I think, at this point, right? But he still, I think he still does the convention circuit. I've seen pictures of him with some of the other cast members from Boy Meets World, Topanga, uh, the uh, the older brother, uh, uh, oh, God. Fuck. Will Friedle is the actor who played the uh, older brother on the show. Eric Matthews. Thank you, thank you. Eric. It was Eric Matthews. Yes. Anyway, I just had a, uh, I just had a, a brain freeze there. Now you got me thinking about TV shows. I better, I better get out of here. <laughs> hey, Trent, welcome to the channel, brother. I will see you on Wednesday night. Take care, guys.